It's the week before Halloween, and the mailman works diligently, delivering his appointed route. Walking at a brisk but safe speed, he shuffles stacks of mail balanced haphazardly on his left hand and on his left forearm. The mail picks up volume this time of year, and the extra mail weighs heavy on his arm and shoulders. Adjusting his satchel, he ascends one of the countless front porch steps on his expansive route. The territory he covers is mostly residential, multi-family homes with a good number of single-family homes dispersed throughout. This is an old town in upstate New York. The town shows its age and its character of its homes and roads. A handful of large Victorian homes grace the neighborhood with their majesty. Now in various states of disrepair, they are vague representations of their former selves, but grand nonetheless. On the banks of the Hudson River, the town had at one point come to know a fair amount of wealth in the later part of the 19th century. Remnants of a once prosperous time still remain, adding texture and substance to an otherwise unremarkable town. His shift starts before the sun peers over the low rolling hills. Tiredly, the city carrier cases his route. Thousands of pieces of mail. Everything from letters, magazines, to 48 packs of toilet paper and 60-pound bags of dog food. If it has a stamp, it gets delivered. As the time clock strikes 9 a.m., the mail has been cased, pulled down, banded in trays, stacked neatly in a hamper, and wheeled down a ramp to his delivery vehicle. The temperamental old truck rumbles to life. Seemingly on its last legs, it emits a puff of white smoke out of the exhaust as it idles. Shortly after having left the office, he rounds the bend into his part of town that is so familiar to him that he could tell you the names of most, if not all, of the customers. Not only that, but he knows who lived there before then. This job is all mental, he says. Once you establish a pattern, your body will repeat it automatically, leaving the mind to do most of the work. Sorting through a handful of letters as he approaches his next delivery, he picks out a few envelopes that have been missorted by the computers at the sorting facility. A common occurrence. He is always on the lookout for anything that doesn't belong. Bad letters, as he, as he calls them, are tucked into his satchel, almost so well executed it's like sleight of hand. You wouldn't notice it's happening unless you were told to look for it. The day goes on. After his lunch, he resumes delivery. Pulling up to the next street, he puts the truck in park, cranks the wheel all the way to the right, engages the parking brake, and turns off the truck. Grabbing the mail from the back of the truck for his next carry, he starts off at 102 Adams Ave, then to 100, and so on. He knows most of his customers, and they know him just as well. But a few houses don't get any mail. Some are vacant or abandoned. Some are occupied by transients without an established residence. Some houses appear to be lived in, but receive very little mail, almost none at all. He calls these houses ghost houses. People live there, you just never see them. Busy people, antisocial people, old or sick people, bed-bound or cut off, hermits. He makes up stories in his head to explain why each of them might be as mysterious as he assumes them to be. The day is getting late, and the route is nearly done. At this time of year, the sun sets around 5 p.m. With little sunlight left, the more shaded streets provide inadequate lighting for him to sort the mail in between houses while walking. It's a considerable risk walking blindly on the old, uneven sidewalks. So as a precaution... He only sorts the mail when he arrives at the mailbox. Crossing the street, he sees his next delivery. Two Forest Ave. One of the old Victorian-style homes, possibly the biggest in town. This delivery is tricky. Walk through the yard to the back gate. Around the side of the house and at the back door, an old wicker basket is secured to an iron rail. On the basket is a weathered label with the name Piscaldo. The mailman finds the name to be as uncomfortable to pronounce as it is to look at. For whatever reason, he's never liked this house. Mostly, it's an inconvenient delivery, being that the box is at the back door. 
but also that this is one of the ghost houses whose occupant has never introduced himself or even been seen by him in the five years on the route. A light shines from inside the house. A relic from times past, an anchor in history. Like time had continued as the house cemented itself firmly, resisting change and stubbornly remaining as it once was. Shortly after the carrier has finished his route and returns to the office, the process continues the next day and the day after that. Case the route, deliver the route, go home. The days get shorter as sunlight becomes a precious commodity. The sun is setting and at least an hour of his route is delivered in the dark. A flashlight on a headband becomes part of the uniform this time of year. From door to door, in a careful manner, his route is delivered a letter at a time. Slowly, with an abundance of caution, Many dangers can hide in the dark. He knows this all too well. A gopher hole in someone's front yard can be invisible without the sun's light to expose the hazard. A loose step, a broken rail, unleashed dog, any number of things can hide in the dark. So easily consumed by his work, he worries he might miss any one of these dangers. He takes his time. The cold fall air makes his breath fog as he exhales. A few street lights provide comfort. While crossing the street, he finds himself at the dark corner in front of two forest ave. A single letter from, from some charity organization in his right hand he considers not delivering. The customer surely won't miss it, and after all, it'll end up in the trash or recycling bin. His momentary hesitation is interrupted by a light in the house. He sees the pale light of a lamp as it's turned on behind a sickish pale pink curtain. Everything gets delivered, he says to himself under his breath. More fog in the air as he sharply exhales the words. Around the side of the house and through the gate to a pitch black yard. His headlamp leads the way. Eyes focused on the wicker basket 40 feet in front of him. His headlamp, long strides through the overgrown grass make a swishing sound. Boots on cold, damp earth. The fabric of his pants rub together. Heavy breathing, in and out, fill the silence of the land. Dropping the letter and pivoting around to go back, out the way he has come. His eyes watch for a moment, the light in the kitchen. A bulb hangs from the ceiling, casting an uncomfortable light in an otherwise dark house. Out the gate, through the yard, as he passes by the window with the pink curtain and the lamp, a small gap in the curtain has his interest as he looks through it innocently as he passes by. Distracted by curiosity, a noise goes unnoticed, but quickly comes into focus, as just then a familiar rattle of a dog's collar speeds closer from behind. His heart reacts before he does pumping blood violently. The thud in his chest feels like the gravity of the world had come to rest on his heart. Reactively, spinning around to assess the threat, he locks eyes with a fast approaching pit bull. Small but quick, it gets to him just as he acquires his pepper spray and targets the dog. A spray to the eyes and nose sends the dog, confused and in pain, backstepping and licking its jowls. The mailman yells, Get out of here! and the dog responds with a hasty retreat. Defeated and blind, the dog bis disappears into the night. Heart pounding, but grateful for the outcome, the mailman picks up some letters he dropped off the ground that have fallen in the heat of the encounter. The pale light from the window shines out directly on the lawn where he stands and where the letters are fall have fallen. Gathering up the letters down on his left knee, the light from the window flickers and fades, then comes back, Standing up, he looks through the window at an old face just behind the curtain, looking back at him. Odd. Well, now I know what Miss Piscaldo looks like, he thinks. She must have heard either the dog or I and come to the window to see what was going on. He gathers himself and stares back at the face behind the curtain. A small, kind face, expressionless and wrinkled. I raise my hand and wave 
I say, sorry for that. A dog came out of nowhere. Before the sentence was complete, she turned around and switched off the lamp, leaving him in, in her side yard talking to a dark window. He chuckled and shook his head. Shut in, he says as he walks away and down the street, now more cautious than ever. The next day, the day before Halloween, vibrant fall colors contrasted with a stark gray sky. A cold day, colder than normal. His hands hurt in the, from the sudden change in temperature. The tip is, tips of his fingers are numb, making his job just that much more challenging. While loading the truck in the morning, he talks to a coworker about the near dog attack that he experienced and about the old lady in the window. His coworker mentioned that the lady that lives there must be over a hundred years old. The other carrier said, She was old when I started 25 years ago. Now she must be ancient. They laughed while they turned away from one another and went back up the ramp into the office. Later that day, out on his route, he made good progress despite the mail volume. Because he was doing so well, he had enough time to talk casual conversation with a few customers. Most customers talk about their lives, their previous hardships and things that came to be. They talk of the weather and current events. Did you see what the president did now? Belted out Miss Warrington while she walks her small fluffy dog. The breeze blowing her gray and brown hair straight back on her head. A breeze so strong, it makes your eyes water and your cheeks flushed. No mail for two forest Ave, and he's thankful. He doesn't even look at the house. Not out of fear, but out of suspicion that he's being observed from within by an old, by a century-old homebody. Almost as if out of respect for her, he just averts his eyes and moves to the next house. It's Halloween. This day for a mailman is like any other, except there is an off chance you might get some candy from a few of your more thoughtful customers. Like any other day, he repeats, he repeats his task. Autopilot. It's all instinct. Sometimes an hour will go by and he has only a slight comprehension of delivering any mail. He goes somewhere else inside of his head. The imagination takes over. In his head, he sees the house. He sees the face. He sees, he sees the lines in her skin. He sees the loose flesh under her chin as it hangs low and casts awkward shadows. He sees all of this while maintaining accurate deliveries and somehow not getting hurt. Piles of leaves and pumpkins. Fake cobwebs and corn stalks. Every house is decorated. Some trick-or-treaters are on the street now, as school had let out over a half an hour ago. Approaching the next house, he sees a family waiting for him at the door. A family of three with a bowl of candy and generous looks in their eyes. He jokingly, jokingly declares, Trick-or-treat! While handing the mail to the mother, she offers the bowl of candy to the carrier. He takes a piece. Small talk ensues, and a group of trick-or-treaters is seen up the street. The mother remarks, I don't know why they knock on that door of that old house. That lady died almost two years ago. The house stands alone at the other end of the street, a white house with a dead tree in the front yard. Two Forest Ave. The mailman says quickly, No, she's still there, well over a hundred years old by now, I'd guess. The mother looks frustrated and responds, Miss Piscaldo? No, 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 no. She was taken to a nursing home and died the next day. This all happened like two years ago. I'm sure of it. A look of dread takes a hold of the mailman's face. There's a light on inside the house all the time and someone collects the mail. Also, I'm fairly certain I've seen someone in the house at least once. He responds, losing confidence in his words as they leave his mouth. All but the mother remain outside as the air is bitter and brisk. Moving back inside, she says, Maybe it's her ghost. She laughs a silly, spooky laugh. Like she knows just how absurd her statement was, but made it just for effect. The mailman left perplexed, nervous, and full of doubt, continues delivering mail. 
growing ever closer to the White House. Every delivery he makes, he can see the house clearer and clearer. The sun is dim behind the clouds, and the sky's pale light makes no effort to put the mailman at, at ease. It's just dark enough to see the one light bringing life to an otherwise dead house, a ghost house. Eerie, he thinks, strange that he can see the light from down the street. He looks down at his letters and in, in his hand and fingers through to see if there's any mail for two Forest Ave. Yes, there is. As usual, a letter with very little importance or value, but a letter nonetheless. Crossing the street to the dark corner, the house seems very impressive today. Four stories tall, a huge wraparound front porch window, windows that stretch from floor to ceiling. Alongside the house to the left is a path to the back gate. Passing by the window with the lamp and pink curtain, he peeks at it quickly while walking by. Too quickly, not able to focus, he didn't see much of anything. Opens the gate, clicks, and, it, and he stops. Holding the letter in his hand, he thinks that if this person is deceased, he probably shouldn't deliver the mail anymore. It only occurred to him just now. Turning to walk out, he stops in his tracks. The back door is open almost all the way as he watches the wind move the door, swinging open and closed. He decides to leave regardless, no reason to investigate this any further, knowing now that the house is vacant. It's probably just some kids messing around with the spooky old house while out trick-or-treating. Not another step before he hears from within the house a thud and a muffled scream. Staring at the door as it swings again in the breeze, the wind howls, the sun is setting. Again, from inside the house, he hears a voice call to him. Loud and painful moans. Surely, this is just some misunderstanding. Walking closer to the back door so he can listen in and decipher what it is that's causing this ungodly noise. He stutters and coughs, clears his throat, and he says, Hey, is anyone in there? A moment passes and the wind swirls up leaves, stirring and spinning loudly. He thinks he can hear a voice crying, but it's hard to tell because the wind is so loud. He takes a rubber band and wraps it around the mail in his hand and puts the mail into his satchel. Listening, he can hear crying coming from inside the house, a loud, desperate moan. He's terrified. He considers that a woman is in danger, and if he doesn't act, she will die. He also considers that this house is haunted. The very idea makes him second-guess his judgment. He considers how foolish a thought that is. He enters the house, closes the door behind him to keep it from swinging in the wind. He calls out, Hello? No response. He looks around and finds himself on a landing between the kitchen and the basement. A light in the kitchen invites him in. Smells of mildew and age. The house is less inviting inside than it is on the outside. A bang on the wall, he jumps. Another bang, he jumps again. The sounds are coming from next, the next room. The kitchen has two doors. He moves quietly to one of the doors, almost visibly shaken from fear. He knocks on the door and calls out, Are you okay? No answer. He turns the knob. It doesn't move. Despite this, he tries again. Still nothing. Moving to the next door, he finds a dark smudge on the doorframe. Almost black in this light, he examines it closer. He glistens in the poorly lit room. Blood. Dark red blood. Fresh and dripping. At this point, he cons convinces himself to leave. But again, a bang interrupts him. It's just behind the door with the blood smear. He acts quickly, and with a sudden sur surge of courage, he opens the door wide to a ghastly figure standing drenched in blood, stark naked and arms reaching out to him. 
The mumbling ghoul bubbles and spurts up blood from a wound so severe in its throat that you can hear the air moving in and out of it as it tries to breathe. The mailman pauses in horror, paralyzed. In a fear-induced living coma, he bears witness to this sight as it steps a shuttered step towards him. As if it had broke him somehow, he can't act. Not until it steps once more into a better light and he sees it looking at him. It's lifeless, and yet it's right there. A bloody mess of a walking corpse. With bony hands reached out, the ghoul tries to grab the mailman. Almost reactively, he snaps out of it and connects his right fist to the ghoul's head. Slam! It falls down. Blood pooling. A lifeless gasp for air from the windpipe. A silence takes over the room. The howling winds have stopped, and all that remains is a ringing in his ears. Piss runs down his leg, and he draws in air in a sudden desperate gasp. His voice shakes as he weeps, and he walks out of the house to the neighbor's house across the street to get help. He can't explain it logically, so he insists that the neighbors come with him, and they call the cops. The neighbors ask him, What's wrong with my Spice Caldo? He thinks for a minute and says with doubt, She died two years ago, almost phrasing the statement as if it were a question. The people who live across the street explain to him that Miss Pis- that the Pascaldo sisters lived there together. All of their lives, they lived in that house until one had fallen ill and died after being removed to a care facility. The one that had remained in the home, 109 years old, and living there independently with the help of neighbors and whatever family that, that had remained. The mailman says through tears as the first responders arrive, What I saw in that house... I think, I, I mean, it, it wasn't alive. The mailman watches the, the family watches the mailman weep as they moved from inside the house to the front yard. Dozens of people now gather at the house with the ambulance, fire trucks, and several police cars lighting up the dark house on the dark corner. From the street, we see lights and movement inside. So strange to see life in this dead house. After some time, they come out with a stretcher, draped in white cloth. No one's in a hurry to depart once the gurney is loaded. They remain on the scene, and the focus turns to the mailman. He explains what happened and describes who or what he saw inside as best as he could. He said that the fear made him think that what he saw was a ghost or something like it. The police are suspicious and they take him in for further questioning. Still in his uniform, the mailman sits slumped in a wooden chair that's bolted to the ground in a room with no windows and concrete walls. Footsteps echo loudly as they approach. The door opens to reveal a host of detectives and investigators. Over the next few minutes, more details are revealed about what the mailman was doing in the house and why he delivered a fatal blow to the skull of a 109-year-old woman. Come to find out that the Piscaldo sisters were the wealthiest people in town at one point. During the 1940s and 1950s, they made millions in local real estate development. In the post-war boom, they had amassed a wealth of over $30 million dollars. That home on Forest Ave had at one point been the most luxurious mansion in the whole state. Besides himself, beside himself, the mailman insists that he heard cries from for help from inside the house and only entered the house to investigate. He said that it was when he entered the living room he found what appeared to be a grotesque and disfigured ghost. The detectives hung on his every word. Jotting, jotting down notes and pleasantly engaging in his narratives of the events that have transpired. The lead detective, a tall, bone-thin man with dark hair, asked innocently, If you thought she was a ghost, what made you think a punch to the head would do anything? Snickering to himself awkwardly. The mailman responded quickly, I acted impulsively, but I was afraid. I mean, come on, her throat was ripped out of her neck and... 
She had blood pouring down the front of her and her hands, or they, they were just bone. His voice cracks as the last bit of air in his body is exhaled. Breathing in a chest full of air, the room watches him in silence. The detective leans in, putting his elbows on his knees and scratching his neck and chin. He locks eyes with the mailman and says, Well, you see, that's the problem, sir. We found Miss Piscaldo's body on her living room floor, just like you said, except her throat was not gashed open, nor were her hands stripped of flesh as you so morbidly described. The mailman shakes his head. No response. We are going to have to get your story straight, sir, if you want this process to move on. Otherwise, we'll sit here all night. What do you say? says the detective. The mailman nods with his head in his hands. What I'm saying is true. I know what I saw, says the mailman. Leaning back, the detective looks the mailman up and down and responds. What I think you saw is some sort of fabrication. You see, it's Halloween. Ghouls and goblins are running around the streets from house to house, and here you are, working long hours, maybe pushing yourself in bad conditions, and it's possible that your imagination has betrayed you. Perhaps the stress combined with fear and panic caused a momentary delusion. I mean, I'm, I'm no psychoanalyst, but I, I've seen this type of thing before. People can be pushed only so far, and if they're backed into a corner, the mind does crazy things when it's confronted with what, look, what can look like a threat. A pause as the words are left to digest. The, de the, the, the detective continues, Also, I might add, that you are the mailman, and you would know a certain intimate detail concerning Miss Piscaldo's wealth and age, wouldn't you? The statement is cast out like an anchor, and the chain is fixed on the mailman's conscience. Another pause. The buzz of the fluorescent lighting hums over the room and agitates an already palpable environment. Standing to his feet, the detective says loudly, We've got all night. Think it over. We'll be back in a few hours. The men shuffle out, and the mailman looks to the floor with a faraway gaze. Pushed to his limits, and so full of self-doubt, he questions his very existence. A year later, Halloween. The new mailman moves quickly from house to house on his new route. All the customers stop to tell him about the old mailman and how he killed that old lady in her home. The new mailman doesn't like the stories, but listens anyways, trying to be nice to his new customers. He passes that house every day and never, never delivers any mail. Windows and doors boarded up, an overgrown lawn with weeds and grass at eye level. Caution, state, caution tape still hung on the front door. After all this time, the house had remained just as, a, as haunting as it ever was. A dead house on a dark corner. A moment in time, preserved as it decays and fades into a lesser form. One of many houses that had been left to rot long after the ghost that lived within had known that they were dead. A ghost house.